Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly podcast on leadership with Scott Miller, where each week we have the immense honor of interviewing some of the most influential minds in the world. We're now into our fifth year, 250 episodes taped and soon to be aired. Great interviews coming up like Tony Robbins and Brene Brown and Reid Hoffman. And we've interviewed some of the greatest minds in the world, including Liz Wiseman and Susan Cain, Deepak Chopra, Arina Huffington, Ryan Serhant, Ryan Holiday, Robin Sharma, Stephen M. R. Covey. Today, our guest will not disappoint you. Before we talk about him, remind you that each year we also publish a book based on this podcast, the world's largest weekly leadership podcast called Master Mentors. Volume one and volume two are now out in print, digital, audio, and in video found on litvideobooks.com. Each year I write for HarperCollins a fast, easy, breezy collection of my 30 favorite interviews from the previous year with the permission of that guest. I pull out one transformational insight from them and write a chapter about that. Hope you'll pick up a copy of Master Mentors, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Volume 3 coming out in the fall of 2023 on our way to 10 in the series. Today's guest is the seminal author. He is the founder and principal of the Black Swan Group. His name is Chris Voss, and he's authored a book that has sold nearly 4 million copies. You know it as Never Split the Difference negotiations as if your life depended on it. And he would know something about that as being a former FBI hostage negotiator. Chris, welcome to On Leadership. Yeah, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Chris, no podcast is complete until you've landed Chris Voss. So we're honored to have you teach us today a little bit more about negotiation. Uh, Chris, I've spent the better part of my nearly 40-year career in sales, sales leadership and marketing where, of course, the essence of that is negotiation and a compromise, seeking third alternatives. Today, you're going to teach us some insights around the role that empathy plays in negotiation. I'm sure you'll share some great stories on what are some of the great tenets of not just hostage negotiation, where your life depends upon it, but perhaps even in sales and relationships, where relationships and sometimes paying your mortgage depends upon you being a great negotiator. Uh, Chris, talk a little bit about the Black Swan Group and what led you to write Never Split the Difference. Yeah, well, when I, when I started on this whole journey of uh, learning hostage negotiation, crisis intervention, it just seemed to be, to me, to be too powerful to just be limited to hostage negotiation. I actually started by volunteering on a suicide hotline and started applying that into my daily life. And just kept doing it. It was effective. Like everybody wants to be understood. You just you don't have to be in crisis to experience how transforming it is to be understood. And continued on the journey while I was still an FBI agent. Uh, started to collaborate with Harvard because I want to learn about more about negotiation. And I figured you know that was sort of the mecca of negotiation knowledge. And when I was there at Harvard, they said, "Look, you know, you you guys, you're doing the exact same thing we are. The stakes are different." but the dynamics are the same. So I ended up teaching uh, at Harvard Law School in their negotiation course. And then when I got out, I was just ready, when I left the FBI, I was ready to put this into business and personal life and taught in a couple of business schools, made my students use the skills in their everyday life and then put it together enough that my son and I, Brandon, you know, we thought we had it pulled together. We put a book out. And like I said, it has done extraordinarily well, selling nearly four million copies. Don't know anyone who's not a sales leader that hasn't read Never Split the Difference. Uh, Chris, let's jump right into the concept of negotiation. You say that people tend to have two basic needs when they're in negotiation. They are to feel secure and to feel in control. Will you expand on those to open us up today? Yeah, you know, and, and, and what they really don't know is how much they need to feel understood. But yeah, people feel secure. You don't want to be threatened. I mean, one of the first moves to get into a really collaborative negotiation is removing yourself as a threat to the other side. It could be as simple as your tone of voice. Your tone of voice, before you've finished a sentence, begins to shape in their mind whether or not you're a threat. You know, those of us that are natural born assertives, I'm a natural born assertive. You know, I think of myself as direct and honest. That feels, on the other end, is blunt and attacking. So if I don't watch my tone of voice before I finish the sentence, I'm perceived to be a threat, taking them out of security. And then 
uh, further on down a continuum of security, what happens when you feel out of control? I mean, you start to panic. You know, your fears kick into, into gear. The reptilian brain, or however you want to refer to it. Survival mode. Survival is largely negative. Very difficult to make an effective long-term deal with someone who felt out of control through the process. They're very likely to not perform on the deal, which is your real big problem. Yes is nothing without how. You don't get a how, a good how, then your yes is never going to do you any good. I mean, that's an important point you mentioned in your book is that kind of yes doesn't matter without the how. Uh, riff on that. Yeah, well, you know, there's, uh, unfortunately, there's something out there called momentum selling or the yes momentum. Fortunately, unfortunately, you know, I, at one point in time, getting somebody to say yes, a succession of yeses. It's taught as each yes is a micro agreement or a tie down, trying to get commitment. Now, that at one point in time, that was probably a good approach. But people have been flim-flammed, they've been bamboozled, they've been talked into bad deals over yes, and suddenly they find themselves in the middle of a bad deal. So people are sort of yes abused globally. And if so, your yes could be a counterfeit yes. There's three kind of yeses, commitment, confirmation, and counterfeit. Vast majority of yeses are counterfeit. You think you got to deal with a counterfeit yes with no how, that deal is never going to happen. So when you shift out of yes and you really get into how, those sorts of problems go away. How are we going to do this? How are we going to move forward? How are we going to talk about this if we run into problems? There isn't a deal out there that at some point in time doesn't have an implementation problem. You bring that up before it's happened, you've already paved the groundwork for fixing it with the least amount of friction. Chris, another central, well said, by the way, I mean, how many deals have I have managed or led or been involved in where you got a yes that was perhaps out of fatigue or coercion or whatever, whichever the three uh, C's you talked about, and then implementation just, you know, goes, you know, skiwampus on you. One of the big themes of your negotiating method. By the way, can, that, that, that's, that's a scientific term that I like an awful lot. I'm going to use it, skiwampus. Yes, <laughs> well, please quote me on it. My gift to you. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Merry Christmas, right? Merry Christmas to you, sir, and happy Hanukkah. Uh, an important part of your book is about displaying empathy. It's a central theme in negotiating skills. Talk to us. We hear empathy every day from every thought leader, but you have a bit of a different take on the importance of empathy and the role empathy plays. Talk about empathy as it relates to becoming a skilled negotiator. Yeah, it, it, initially it's a, a barrier that's really hard to wrap your mind around it, but once you get to the other side, you know the phrase, it's not about you. When you start, empathy is displaying to the other side that you understand where they're coming from. And this is when I really started to um, uh, collaborate with Harvard. And I knew that we were going to think the same way they did because Bob Manukin wrote this great book called Beyond Winning. It's principally a book about negotiating for lawyers. But in it, you know, Bob talked about empathy and he said, it's not about agreeing or liking. You don't got to like the other side or agree with them in any way, shape, or form to have empathy or to demonstrate empathy. Let's, let's, let's even take it a step farther, demonstrating empathy. And I remember as a hostage negotiator, I'm like, wow, how am I supposed to have empathy with somebody from Al-Qaeda? That's just not going to happen. Or sympathy. How am I supposed to have sympathy? How am I supposed to agree with somebody from Al-Qaeda? If agreement or liking is the necessary element of empathy, then I can't do that. But if it's not, if it's just demonstrating understanding, articulating what their point of view is with no agreement, no disagreement, no liking, just stating it out, then I can have, I can use empathy, I can display empathy with someone from a terrorist organization anywhere in the world. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm not picking on uh, Al-Qaeda as the most visible, but there's terrorist organizations everywhere. It was my job as a hostage negotiator to connect with them and change your behavior, connect via empathy. How do you do that? Just articulate how they see things. You, you see America as a capitalist, um, heartless, uh, anti whoever you are society. I've said that to no shortage of people in terrorist situations. I didn't agree that it was true. And that's the hard part because if you're gonna display empathy, display it, make the other side feel understood, you say it in a way where you don't agree that it's true. It's just you recognize their point of view and you prove to them you recognize their point of view by articulating it. That ends up being transformative for the other side. 
In fact, Chris, I think in the book you call it calculated empathy. Now, obviously, most of us, all of us, are majority of us are not in the role of hostage negotiation or never will be. And we're glad that you were and have trained others. For the person who's listening and watching today that has a sales role, we also know that everybody is in sales. Some of their careers are dependent upon selling and others less so. What would you say is the role that calculated empathy has for someone that's watching or listening who literally has a full-time sales job? They carry a number, they hold a bag, so to speak. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's calculated. It's applied people smarts. What's it calculated by? What's it, um, what's it applied via? For, and to speak in layman terms, the brain is basically negative. Uh, everyone walks around in survival mode. Roughly, again, layman estimation. The neuroscience matches it up pretty close. People are basically 75% negative in survival mode. That's the default. That's what you wake up with first thing in the morning. And in conflict and negotiations about conflict, it's about dividing up resources. The other side's going to be negative. So what, what are we going to calculate our approach with? Knowing they're negative to begin with, to start with. And then secondly, what's the best way to get them out of it? As it turns out, demonstrating empathy, simply observing their point of view, especially the negative aspects of their point of view about us, about ourselves, is the best way to deactivate it, diffuse it, make it go away. The negativity in their head is the elephant in the room. You don't make the elephant in the room go away by denying it's there. And you do less harm, but it doesn't really help to ignore that it's there. What's the best way to get rid of the elephant in the room, the negative emotions that they woke up with because that's their survival mode? Call them out. Instead of saying something as simple as, I don't want you to think the price of my product is high. When someone calls the Black Swan Group, wants to know how much we charge, we say we charge a lot. We're going to charge you more than anybody else ever charged you for this sort of thing. We're calling out the negative, if not inoculating from it. That's the crazy thing that we learned with the Black Swan Method. We can actually inoculate negatives from happening. If you've asked me a question and I know my answer is going to hurt your feelings, I'm going to say to you, this is going to sound harsh. And then I'll answer and it probably won't hurt your feelings. If I hadn't said this is going to sound harsh before the answer, your reaction would have been negative. Like, who do you, you know, will you call me stupid? You know, uh, you're not listening to me. You're going to be insulted by it. So what we're calculating all this by is by the basic human nature wiring and then what best diffuses it to move people into a better place so we can make a great deal. Chris, we're going to get into some tactics of negotiation here in a moment. You shared some great stories in the book, uh, some not about hostage negotiation. Although you might call buying a car hostage negotiation. You share a great story about your Toyota 4Runner and your negotiation for that. For those of us out there bracing for that this season, walk us back through how you bought your Toyota 4Runner and what are some of the replicable lessons all of us can take when we're up against that kind of negotiation? Yeah, it's a great example. Because <clears throat> you, how do, how, do you, how do you deactivate the other, side of argument, other side's arguments against you? So I found this Toyota 4Runner, and it was this beautiful red color, salsa, Red Pearl. Now that was just like, to me, that was like the coolest, most attractive color. I mean, I loved it. And I'd wanted uh, a brand new Toyota uh, SUV for a long time. And like my desire for this truck was just like oozing from my pores. So when I started to talk about this guy and I came in with a very low offer, and then I said, you know, I gotta tell you something. I'm embarrassed to make this offer because this truck is beautiful. Like I'm in love with this truck. I mean, this is the sexiest color I ever saw. And I've looked around and I can't find another one like this for well over a hundred miles. And it's worth every penny of what you guys are asking for. And then I, you know, I hit him with the empathy precedes assertion. I said, but how am I supposed to pay that price? And I had just articulated every reason why this guy was going to talk me into buying a truck. I'm in love with it. And instead, since I had taken the wind out of his sails with his arguments, he just kind of looked at me and he blinked at me a few times. And then he turned around and he, and he went back in the back and, and he came back out with a lower offer. And again, the empathy, I said, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed 
Like it was worth what you guys were asking for before. Now you come back with a lower offer and I, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in love with this truck. I'm totally in love with it. Like if I can't get this truck, I probably won't be able to sleep at night. I said everything that he would have said to me about what he thought his strategic advantages were. And then I hit him again with the, how much, how am I supposed to pay that? And he kept coming down and coming down and coming down. He finally came all the way down to my price. In fact, you, you truncated that. He actually gave you some financing options. He had all kinds of options of how you could do it, but you stuck with your, your principle, if you will, of, uh, of yeah, I'm embarrassed, I can't afford that, I really want it, but you stuck with your original line of thinking. That's difficult for us, right? Because when we think of negotiation, yeah. we think of give and take. We also know there's different types right. of negotiation. Those who negotiate, you know, when they move in, they've moved in from an extreme position. They never thought they would stay in the first place. What advice, is there any like one or two pieces of advice you would give to people that don't want to feel manipulative? They want to feel like they're seeking a mutual win-win without getting screwed. Remind us some yeah. tactical methods where we can, feel, we can feel like both of us are winning without us feeling like we're giving up too much. Yeah, well, you know, there's always a better deal for the other side. I mean, there's, there's always something the other side could throw in that they might not even know is important to you. So how, how do you find it? How do you get there? Some people have referred to negotiation as the art of uh, letting the other side have your way <laughs> or letting them talk themselves into your deal. Get them talking. Uh, the best thing to do to get mutual collaboration is to just start talking with them. Make sure you demonstrate understanding. So, and you say things like, all right, so far you've told me, and then you lay out the things that they've told you. And then you follow that up with, as a result, you feel and lay out what you sense they're feeling. Get them talking. People will tell you everything if they don't think they're wasting their time. And if you've removed yourself as a threat, there's no reason not to tell you. So take an approach where you get them talking, you find out what they're hoping for, what they're worried about. You tease it out of them in a variety of ways. That's where you get both sides to a better deal. There's always a better deal. Chris, is there a specific hostage situation from your years in the FBI where we might have even recognized this or you could talk about it where you implemented some of the tactical things, talking slowly, repeating the last three words they said into the first sentence that you use. Can you tell us a story where perhaps those were life or death, but we can actually implement in our own lives? Yeah, well, we had, we had a kidnapping in the Philippines. Terrorist group claimed to be Al-Qaeda related, south of the Philippines, really bad guys, regardless of who they're affiliated with. And they had an American, they were asking for $10 million, not ransom, but war damages. And they were making up all this nonsense about 500 years of oppression. You know, the Philippines has had colonial invaders 500 years ago with the Spanish. The Japanese have been there. The Americans are essentially had been colonial invaders in the early 1900s. Uh, that's, that's what this guy was saying. The terrorists were saying on behalf of uh, the justification for the penalty for war damages, not a ransom. And we went back and forth on this. And finally, I, the negotiator that I was coaching to talk to the bad guy, I said, look, we're going to summarize this guy today. This is, this is the culmination of all the skills. You know, take everything they've said and even add a few things that we may have le left out. Then start throwing in how they felt about it. And in, in this one, until you understand how powerful it is to fully and completely make somebody feel understood. It can transform somebody. And so I got my negotiator on the phone. We, we practiced, you know, we've been prepping for this for days. Is only trained and untrained. And I trained him into this and summarized everything that the terrorist had said, everything. And what you're driving for as a result of a summary, the magic two words are that's right. You're not looking for yes. And you're not looking for your right. You're looking for that's right. Whatever language they speak, there's a difference between that's right and your right. You're going for that's right. He laid everything out to the terrorist kidnapper. And then after a few moments of silence, the terrorist kidnapper said, that's right. 
And then we let it sink in. It's always important to let it sink in. And there were a few more moments of silence, and the guy who was coaching said, uh, you know, why don't we speak again in a couple of days? And they hung up the phone, and the ransom went away. The $10 million, when the phone was hung up, disappeared. It never, never came back. Kidnapping took a couple twists and turns over the coming months. Ransom was never mentioned again. Non-substantive demands, non-monetary demands were brought up, intermediaries, a number of things. Finally, our hostage walked away. On Monday, Thursday, the Thursday before Easter, our hostage walked, walked away, which means the terrorists got nothing. Kidnappers didn't get a dime. I was back in the Philippines a couple of months after, a couple of weeks after, and connected back up with a negotiator I'd been coaching. And he said, you're not going to believe who called me on the phone. And I said, mm, I don't know. It was a terrorist from the kidnapping. Still knew my negotiator by his undercover name, still had his undercover phone number. And I said, all right, what do you say? And he said, have you been promoted yet? You're really good at what you do. I was going to kill the American. And he kept me from doing that. They should promote you. This coming from a guy who'd lost everything, calling to pay his respects to my negotiator because he'd felt hurt out. And even though he, quote, lost the negotiation, he felt so respected and so connected to this adversary that he called him to let him know that they were still on good terms. Chris, speak more about the techniques you employ when in high stakes negotiation, specifically the two I mentioned around speaking slowly and right. repeating the last three words someone said. Talk about those two things or more and more. Yeah, well, you know, you're referring to what we call the late night FM DJ voice, <laughs> which is a downward inflecting voice. You know, you're slowing your pace down and you don't have to be a man with a deep voice to use that. Anybody can downward inflect. The key, male or female, to downward inflecting, no matter how, what your voice's pitch is, is just dropping your chin when you talk. That automatically brings your voice down. Automatically removes you as a threat. Automatic, automatically makes it feel to them like you know what you're talking about. This calm confidence. And calm is contagious. So the voice, again, begins to, affect the velocity of somebody's thinking before you even finish a sentence. Now, repeating the, the three words, this is the hostage negotiator's mirror. It's not the body language mirror. It's a repetition of one to three-ish last words. Sometimes you could just repeat one word. Sometimes you could repeat no more than five, maybe as many as five. You start with the last words that they just said. It's a great thought connector for the other side. It tells the other side that you heard what they said, but you need some more connection. You meet, need some rewording. It's actually anytime you want to say, what did you mean by that? It's a superior way to continue somebody to talk because if you repeat their words, the message you're sending to the other person is like, I got the words. I just really, I really please need it in uh, reworded in a different way. If you ask somebody, what did you mean by that? Half the time, they just repeat it only louder, like an American overseas. I just talk louder and use the same words they'll understand. <laughs> so the mirror that you're talking about is just this great connector skill. It's a great negotiation skill for introverts or for analytic types that don't like to say a lot, because you don't got to say a lot to mirror. You just repeat the last three words of what they just said, or maybe you can move it around and select one to three words that you want to you want to dig into, you want to find more out about. So the mayor is a great, a great skill to get the other side talking. You mentioned this earlier in the interview. And again, I'd like to speak perhaps to those people who are finding themselves in some sort of negotiation every day, which is all of us, but primarily those who perhaps are the lifeblood of every business, which are those that are actually selling. You know, not much happens until you sell something and can fund the rest of the company. You talked about sort of giving the bad news up front, maybe even yeah. uh, sharing all the issues they're going to have. You know, you won't find this with us or, or, you, or expect us to be too, more expensive than the other or perhaps maybe confessing your own sins up front so you neuter them. Um, is there a time when that goes overboard? What's the best calibration of sort of putting on the table 
the elephant in the room so that you can you know, brush it aside or, or worst case, perhaps it becomes the focal point of the customer. What's the right calibration of that? Yeah, well, everybody knows all the things you'd like to deny. Your gut instinct tells you this either is a problem or could be a problem. It's effectively making a list of the things you'd like to deny. That, and, and it's a list. Like it's no less than five things that are going to come up. The other side's always going to worry about whether or not their time is being wasted. The other side is always going to worry about if you're, if you're, if it's when money's involved, that it's a financial grab on your part. There's a number of things that are always going to be there. Make your list and then drop them out there about three at a time. Say, you, you know, you're probably wondering whether or not you're wasting your time. You, you probably think we're asking an awful lot. You probably got a lot of pressure under you. You probably got better things to do than talk to me. Three to four at a time, your list should be no less than five. It might be as much as 15 or 16. Read the moment. Gather data with your eyes. Effective pauses. And we call it dynamic silence. If the other side is not reacting, it doesn't mean you're missing. It means you're on the right track. It's a really counterintuitive response to getting the negatives out of the way, getting rid of the elephants one at a time. A lot of times people who are new to it say they, they didn't react, so they're horrified that they're missing the mark. Not reacting is you're on the right track and you got to keep going. You keep going until the other side stops you and says, oh, ho, 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 you're being too hard on yourself. Or they're going to give you a clear signal that you've sufficiently deactivated the negatives. Now, what happens if you bring something up that they weren't thinking about? Here's the ridiculous answer to that. It doesn't plant that negative, it inoculates it from it. That's why I said, if you ask me a question and my answer's gonna make it seem dismissive of you or that I don't think you were paying attention, you haven't felt the negative yet, but I'm gonna say, this is gonna sound harsh. And that will have inoculated from the negative response. So this approach in the negatives by calling them out is a ridiculously powerful way to move forward as quickly as possible and make great things happen. Chris, in the book, you list several types of negotiating styles, right? There's a whole, uh, uh, most self-help books, and I've read a few thousand of them, talk about, you know, how <laughs> yeah. to deal with difficult people, how to deal with, you know, annoying bosses, how to deal, you know, no one ever writes a book about how to deal with you, like how do others deal with you, because it's always the other person. You write, uh, in particular, three styles of negotiation techniques, right. the analyst, right. the yep. assertive, yep. and the accommodator, recognizing right. that all of us have that style as well. Will you talk about each of the three of these? First, the analyst. What's the best way to deal with someone who is the analyst? And perhaps what's the best way to understand when you are the analyst as well? Talk about the analyst first. Analysts are highly sensitive to a um, couple things. Uh, they hate disagreement. They hate conflict. They see conflict as one possible set of behaviors and many sets of behaviors. And they see incredibly counter, uh, conflict is incredibly counterproductive. Like you never do disagree with an analyst. If you got a different point of view, analysts love data. So what, instead of saying to them, I disagree, you say, look, let's compare data. I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to open up and talk with you. They just don't want disagreement. They also tend to be very thoughtful. So silence with them is extremely important because they want to take in what you've said and they want to think about it, which means if you're the per type of person that can't shut up, I mean, analysts, you, you're going to drive an analyst crazy because they want time to think. And two out, of th two out of three of these types, they have trouble shutting up for very different reasons. But an analyst likes silence. They hate to be interrupted. They're happy to talk if you've got data to talk about. So these are the things that the analysts really focus on. They come off as being cold and distant. They love the word dispassionate. And what's funny about analysts is they're very passionate about being dispassionate, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a real contradiction. But um, they like to see themselves as, as not getting emotional over things. In point of fact, people need to avoid negative emotions, not emotions, but negative emotions. That's your analyst. 
Speak to what you call the accommodation. Yeah, the accommodators. accommodators. I mean, they love, they love, love, love positive interaction. They're naturally a beat. They smile a lot. They laugh and they joke around. They're very like a bowl. They want to be liked. They want you to like the interaction. Analysts or accommodators tend to make more deals overall than the other two types do. They tend to be hope-based deals. And as we all know, hope is not a strategy. So while the analysts make more deals, they always hope that things will work out and the implementation could be all over the place. I mean, nothing but problematic implementation with accommodators because they were hoping things would be okay. And when they knew about something that was going to be a problem, they hope it'll go away and they don't talk it through or mention it. But they're very likable and they have a tendency to make a lot of deals. And last, you refer to one as called the assertive. Yeah, the direct and honest type. You know, I'm a natural born assertive. Uh, you know, and I once had a colleague tell me when I was being my normal direct and honest type, he said to me, dealing with you is like getting hit in the face with a brick. Assertives are very control oriented. They want to keep talking because they got to stay in control. Got to keep the upper hand. Got to keep talking. And if I go silent, if an assertive goes silent on you, they feel out of control. And if you go silent on an assertive, they think that's because they you you want to hear more. They want you to talk more. So you know, imagine an analyst and an assertive. Analyst is grateful for the silence to think, and the assertive won't shut up. They're sort of very direct and honest, sees one path to what they want, have a tendency to be lacking in reciprocity overall, but very honest. I mean, you know where an assertive is coming from, and each one of these types has something that, that's uh, necessary, essential, and inadequate. And to be a great negotiator, you got to let the other side know where you're coming from. You just got to be nicer about it, more likable, like the accommodator. And the accommodator is not going to tell you what they want because they're worried about it scaring you off. So that's where they fall short. They like ability, but they lack assertion. And the analyst will talk with you. Uh, they're not terribly likable because they seem cold and distant. And they're less assertive on what they're putting forward because they don't want the conflict. But each type has a natural skill that's really essential. If coupled with the other skills, they can be great. Chris, broad question, but what do most of us get wrong when we approach negotiations? Going first. I mean, there's all sorts of bad instruction out there. Go first, make your value proposition, uh, anchor high. Like anchoring high drives deals from the table that you should have made, and you never know, and which means you wasted your time. So going first and anchoring high are bad habits. Uh, however, first you go, we like to say he or she who speaks first loses. Also, he or she who speaks most loses. So let the other side go first. If they're talking more than you are and they talk first, you probably gathered a lot of great information, developed a great rapport with them, and they're going to be much more amenable to working with you, and they're going to avoid working against you valuable information. Beyond that, is there one thing you would implore all of our listeners and viewers today to say, if you can stop doing this or start doing this beyond talking most and going first, what's one thing that would improve everyone's negotiating competency? It would really be inviting the other side to talk first. I mean, making sure that the other side is, has heard you out. Now, you may need to put a little encouragers here and there, probably your tone of voice. Two out of three people have a bad tone of voice. The assertives and the analysts, their tone of voice is kind of productive. And then just, you know, hazard a guess as to how they're doing in the moment emotionally. Don't say, how are you? Hazard a guess. Say, you know, looks like you're having a good day. Feels like you're having a tough day. Looks like something's on your mind. Looks, you look distracted. To get the conversation started is a great way to get him talk. Chris, our time is ending, but I have to ask this question, and it's very Donald Rumsfeld-esque. You say there are three types of information, known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Uh, 
talk to those three as it relates to all of us that have professional jobs that are not in the military, we're not in the FBI, we're not law enforcement officers, we're not dealing in life or death situations, but we are running businesses with P&Ls and investors and shareholders and expectations and people that trust us, customers, vendors, employees. Right. Talk right. about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Yeah, it's kind of a mind bender. Try to wrap, wrap your mind around all those, but start with all the things that you just listed, your P&Ls, your investors, your deadlines, your budgets, all the things that you're holding back in a negotiation that you feel that if the other side knew them, you'd be compromised. They're important. They could change the entire outcome. That's one set of unknowns. It's unknown to the other side. There's never a time when you're not holding that stuff back. If that's true, then the other side's holding up back really important stuff too, that if you just knew it, if they could trust you with it, if you could trust them with your unknowns, your hidden information, you guys could make a better deal. But simultaneously, you're afraid to because it, if it could change the outcome, it could change the outcome for better or for worse in, in your head, in your mind. Now, the unknown unknowns, like where does that stuff overlap? Like if, if you're hiding stuff and they're hiding stuff, there's an overlap of those two things. It's a really great deal. It's what we call black swans. The in tiny little things that are improbable that could change everything. That's where the really sweet information uh, lies. So the, the process of discovering the other side's unknowns, hidden information, and then comparing it to yours is that Donald Rumsfeld-esque unknown unknowns. There's some real dynamite in there, some real solid gold for both sides. If you developed enough of a trust factor between the two of you to be able to actually exchange important, closely held information. Chris, why does someone hire the Black Swan Group? We help people negotiate deals they never thought were possible. We give them the best chance of success for not leaving money on the table. And a black swan method has been shown to work in every country on earth. Never split the differences in 36 countries and 36 languages. It sells well in China with Chinese negotiating with other Chinese. It sells well in India, in Pakistan, in Latin America. It sells well globally because people globally want to be understood. And we teach people how to have something that works everywhere. Chris Voss, it's been an honor to add you to our roster of phenomenal guests on leadership. Your book, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as If Your Life Depended Upon It. Thanks for your time today. Appreciate you teaching us a few small things on how to better maybe negotiate the price of our car in the coming days as well, too. Thank you, sir. Great having you on. Yeah, pleasure was mine. Thank you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. <laughs>